Welcome everyone. Today we have an exclusive look, uh, a behind the scenes look at how we prepare to send spacecraft into space. My name is Magdalena and I'm an engineer at the Canadian Space Agency and I'm here joined today by Jean-Michel, an engineer at MDA. Today we're going to answer some of the questions that you have provided us over the last couple of days. Bienvenue tout le monde. Aujourd'hui, on vous offre un accès exclusif dans les coulisses de la fabrication des satellites. On vous montre les étapes à suivre avant de pouvoir les envoyer dans l'espace. Je m'appelle Magdalena et je suis une ingénieure à l'Agence spatiale canadienne. Et je suis ici avec Jean-Michel, un ingénieur chez MDA. Nous allons répondre aux questions que vous nous avez envoyées ces dernières journées. So, Jean-Michel, can you give us a little bit of context? Where are we standing right now? Where yes. are we? Yes, well, first of all, welcome to our facilities. We are at, uh, in Montreal, on the island of Montreal, in saint anne de bellevue And this is where we are integrating the three spacecraft for the Rudersat Constellation mission. Alors, nous sommes à saint anne de bellevue à Montréal, pour intégrer les trois satellites qui vont servir pour la constellation de Radarsat. Merci. Canada, as we know, is a leader in Earth observation. So this is uh, just another big step yep. in uh, our Ab journey. Absolument. Le Canada est le chef de file dans tout ce qui est de l'observation de la Terre, de, de la télédétection. Alors, euh, on est chanceux aujourd'hui. On voit où est-ce que ça se passe. Et ça se passe ici, à Montréal, au Canada. Oui. I, I personally love our fashion sense, but maybe some people are yeah. wondering why we're dressed this way. Yeah, we are well dressed. Huh? Yes, uh, we are. Lab coat, <laughs> uh, hairnet. Uh, this is because we are in a clean room, so we don't have any particles flying all over the place and contaminate our satellites. Alors, nous sommes dans une salle propre. Nous ne voulons pas que des particules contaminent uh, venant de nos vêtements ou de nos cheveux contaminent les composantes uh, spatiales sur les satellites. Alors, on se protège de cette façon. So we have a first question on Twitter from Amanda's students, and the question is, what is the CA work, CSA working on in regards to satellite? And so as we mentioned before, it's RCM, Radar Set Constellation Mission. This mission is composed of three satellites, as you mentioned, Jean-Michel, mm -hmm. that will be observing the Earth. Yep. Um, we'll, have, we'll be able to observe about 90% of the Earth's surface uh, during this mission. And it's amazing because these are the actual satellites that are going up into space. This is the only opportunity to see them before they go up. Yes, actually, we are in the middle of the action. As you can see here, we have two spacecraft currently being integrated. Alors, nous sommes dans le milieu de l'action. On a présentement deux satellites en phase d'intégration. Alors, si on peut s'approcher ici, je vais vous montrer un petit peu qu ce que nous sommes en train de faire. Donc, on a le satellite ici, le satellite numéro 3 de la constellation, euh, sur lequel on vient tout juste d'enlever les panneaux solaires et on va se préparer pour des tests en, en, électro, uh, en compatibilité électromagnétique. Alors, we are getting ready to go into EMC testing, so electromagnetic compatibility testing, with the spacecraft number three. And if you look behind here, we have the spacecraft number two, so just follow me. Donc, uh, Manish on Twitter was asking, what will be the use of this mission and how will we benefit from it? Uh, this is, of course, first and foremost, an Earth observation mission. So we'll be monitoring environmental change, um, climate change, ecosystem monitoring, natural disasters such as floods and fires uh, for emergency management. But also agriculture can use these images in order to understand soil moisture and crop uh, growth. Uh, so it's a very useful uh, satellite system for Canadians and internationally as well. Thank you, Manish, for the question. Alors, on peut vous constater ici, nous sommes en plein déploiement de, des antennes radar. Alors, we are having the radar antenna deployed, so we can see one side of the spacecraft. And uh, we are currently doing the alignment activities on that, uh, on that spacecraft, so we can see some operators uh, using computers and laser tracker to see uh, how, what, what kind of movement the targets located on the spacecraft are moving when we are moving components, major components like the SAR antenna or the radar antenna. So we want to make sure that the spacecraft is always stable, very stable. So this is what we are doing here. We are computing how much movement is being done when we deploy and stow the radar antenna. And one of the things, as you mentioned, the main um, 
item on the spacecraft is the radar antenna. Absolutely. And why is radar important? It's because it can be used in many different weather conditions and day or night. So we have a continuity of view um, that is created by using the synthetic aperture radar SAR antenna. Absolutely. Une particularité de ce radar là, c'est qu'on peut voir à travers les nuages et lorsqu'il fait noir sur la Terre. Donc ce n'est pas un radar optique, mais plutôt de télédétection. Donc ça, ça se fait par fréquence radio. C'est ce qui fait que c'est particulier en termes en terme d'observation de la Terre. Et c'est unique ici au Canada qu'on fait ça. Sur Instagram, Ashutosh has asked, how do you prepare a spacecraft? So I think he's talking about the phases of the concept, phases. design, yes, sure. development. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. It starts with a design phase where we have a bunch of engineers who are work, working all together to make a design, a concept of a spacecraft for a specific mission. So uh, this one is particular because we have three spacecraft. So it makes it uh, even more interesting. And then once we have the design completed, obviously we go to the drawing boards where we are drawings and then we manufacture parts and then we assemble, assemble everything and then we test them. This is what we are doing now. We are testing the spacecraft before we bring them into space. And so Maria's grade eight students actually had a question on that. And they're saying, how are instruments tested for structural integrity and to see if they function? What kind of tests yeah, that's are a good, there? That's a good question. As you know, uh, during the, uh, the launch of the spacecraft, you know, the spacecraft is launched into space using a rocket. That rocket creates a lot of vibration, a lot of noise. So we need to replicate this environment here on Earth to test the satellite such that we know that it can survive when we launch it into space. So we do a vibration test on the spacecraft. So we put the spacecraft on the shaker and we test the spacecraft to make sure that everything survives. All the components will survive the vibration test. Then we bring the spacecraft in Ottawa in the acoustic facility where we send a lot of noise against the spacecraft. This replicate the noise of a launcher and this noise create load on the spacecraft. So we want to make sure that all the components will survive this extra noise on that spacecraft. Obviously, during the mission, there is a lot of thermal activity in space. As we know, space is a very harsh environment. So it's very hot when the sun is shining, very cold because of the deep space. So we need to uh, make sure that uh, we test the spacecraft under the similar thermal condition here on Earth. So for that, we go to the David Florida Laboratory in Ottawa, where we bring the spacecraft inside a huge thermal vacuum chamber, and we simulate the space environment, the environment in space, by moving the different temperature of that chamber and having some uh, solar representative panel that simulate the sun inside the chamber. This way, we can test the satellite entirely the way it will be, uh, it will be in space. It's super interesting. Yeah, because yeah. we know that we cannot go back in space and fix the spacecraft, right? It's not like a car. You have a car that breaks out and you go to the garage. That's easy. But there is no uh, such a garage in space. So right. we need to make sure that they, functional, uh, they are totally functional before we send them up there. And so I guess a follow on to that, uh, Tung Li on Facebook was asking what kind of materials are used for spacecraft to withstand such extreme conditions? Oh yeah, we are using different types of materials, uh, titanium, magnesium, mostly aluminum. So the core, the main structure of the spacecraft is aluminum. So, uh, and we also use, because of the mass, the weight of a spacecraft, it's very expensive to send mass in space. So we need to keep it as light as possible. Therefore, we are using light material like aluminum uh, honeycomb panel, mm -hmm. very, very uh, uh, stiff structure, very tough, but also very light. So it's very, very common that we find these materials on a spacecraft. And so Charlie White on Twitter was asking about the many layers of insulation that are required to keep the satellite protected during its lifespan uh, and sort of what the thickness is of that material and why is it gold colored? For example, yeah, maybe we, we can on look better one. on the spacecraft number three, yeah. where we see the uh, goldish kind of color on the blanket, on the thermal blanket. So, uh, sorry. So uh, we can see we have two different type of, uh, of blanket. So we have those that are more like silver. Those are sort of uh, germanium blanket on the polyamide film. And they have, they have, because they are on the SAR antenna, on the radar, they have to be RF transparent. We don't want the RF to be blocked by those blankets. So that's why they have that specific color. 
And on the uh, side of the spacecraft, the goldish color is also the same kind, kind of film, but uh, with a different uh, aluminum um, vaporized uh, material. So does it help more with the blocking of some of the absolutely, solar rays? Absolutely, yeah. yes, it protects the, the spacecraft from the... Uh, from the, the it's, it's, it has a major thermal purposes, mm -hmm. so it keeps the spacecraft in a more stable environment using these blankets. Now, sticking with um, materials questions, Dylan Smith on Twitter was asking how feasible it would be to make a spacecraft out of 100% recycled materials. Oh, well, we're not there yet. <laughs> Maybe someday, uh, using all kinds of new technologies as well. But I would say the main, the main problem today would be the, the outgassing effect. Like, mm -hmm. we, you cannot bring any material into space because it outgas. There is all kinds of, uh, of gas that once you put a material under vacuum would vaporize into some, some gas. So you don't want to do that because you would contaminate very sensitive equipment mm -hmm. like uh, star tracker or like maybe telescope on spacecraft. So you don't want to contaminate those, uh, you know, very uh, fragile items. Yeah. So we need to be careful before we send any kind of material into space. But I, maybe in the far future, maybe it's, it's going to become possible to, to reuse that. Maybe we'll see if Dylan can uh, figure that out for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Ray Richelieu sur Facebook, il a demandé la durée de la vie d'un satellite dépend-il euh, exclusivement de sa position par rapport au Soleil? Oh, non. À vrai dire, la durée de vie d'un satellite est surtout due à la quantité de, de propergol, d'essence, je peux dire, <laughs> qu'on va mettre dans le, dans le système de propulsion. Euh, on sait que pour des satellites en basse orbite, comme le, les, les trois satellites de RCM, euh, ils sont sollicités par soit des vents solaires ou par euh, l'oxygène atomique en haute atmosphère, parce que ce sont quand même des satellites qui sont en basse altitude. Hein? Alors, il y a encore de l'oxygène atomique. 600 km environ. 600 km d'altitude, ouais. exactement, par rapport à la Terre. Ce qui fait que le satellite est soit freiné, est freiné par euh, ce coefficient aérodynamique-là, qui est l'atomique oxygène, et il y a aussi le fait que la Terre n'est pas parfaitement ronde. Hein? Ouais. Tout le monde sait que la Terre a plus la forme d'une poire. Hein? Ce qui fait que ça, ça perturbe aussi l'attitude, la façon que le satellite se comporte dans l'espace. Et on doit faire des corrections en utilisant justement le, le, le propergol du satellite. Et ces corrections-là doivent se faire assez souvent. C'est ce qui détermine surtout la durée de vie du satellite. Parce que lorsqu'on n'a plus de propergol, c'est là que le satellite est est mort, on ne peut plus l'utiliser parce qu'on n'a plus moyen de, le con de contrôler son attitude et de maintenir son orbite. Donc, okay. so les matériaux sont moins affectés que, uh, par exemple, l'altitude que nous devons maintenir pour les satellites. C'est une question intéressante de Brian sur Twitter. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a une faillite de panneaux solaires pour une faillite de panneaux solaires? Et si l'un est damagé, est-ce que l'autre peut atteindre les requirements de la puissance pour les satellites? Oui, il y a des faillites de panneaux solaires. Redundancy. Actually, the, we have only one main deployable solar panel on the spacecraft, and we have also a CASA, which is which stands for Keep Alive Solar Array. So mm -hmm. this one is fixed. It's a smaller one, and it's fixed on the spacecraft. Uh, those are not redundant, but they have cells. They are divided into cells within the same solar panel, and those are like you can if if let's say a micro meteorite hits a, a cell on the solar array we still can use the rest of the, the, rest of the cells. So, so, so they're it's, not connected all together, but they're a Exactly, bit, uh, which make it not redundant, but at least it's not a, like a single point failure right. if ever a micro, micro meteorite hits the, the solar arrays. Um, we have a question from Connor on Instagram. Uh, with recent advancements in all sorts of electrical components, are you able to use more off-the-shelf items to build the satellite? Or do you have to design a lot of these elements yourself? We still we still do a lot of design of components, but the, the, the I would say the tendency is now to use as much as possible uh, cuts like uh, off-the-shelf equipment. So for sure, the more we we go with the technologies, and we will use more and more uh, directly off-the-shelf equipment. Yeah. So we're getting there. Uh, originally, we we're designing basically everything, but now we can see that there is a, a trend to go with uh, off-the-shelf equipment. Okay, and we have an Instagram question from Nugraha. Uh, how do you regulate heat up there? Uh, and especially when there's sloshing liquid in a spacecraft, is there special treatment for this? Oh yeah, 
Well, it depends on the way the, the spacecraft is, is designed. There are spacecraft that use a fluid loop, so it's basically like heat pipes, mm -hmm. where you have a liquid, some sort of a gas and liquid that goes all around the spacecraft structure to maintain a stabilized environment, thermal environment. On RCM, on this satellite here, we don't have such heat pipes, but we use, uh, we use heaters. It's like a, a sticker, a patch, okay. that you bond on the different uh, panels or on very sensitive uh, unit, electronic units, to keep some level of uh, comfortable temperature. Right. And uh, this way we can uh, maintain an, an acceptable environment inside the spacecraft. So it's interesting because, yes, the environment in space is very, uh, you know, we have big swing in temperature, but inside the spacecraft, it's fairly stable mm -hmm. because of all these uh, little uh, thermal patch that we use and also some radiator. Uh, we can see one actually here, a radiator. It's like a mirror surface there at the bottom of the, of the spacecraft. So that, that tells us that there is a, 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 an equipment mounted inside the spacecraft against that wall that needs to dissipate a lot of heat mm -hmm. that is very hot. So we are using this mirror to dissipate that heat from the inside of the spacecraft of that specific unit to space using this mirror. So this one will never have any blanket or any thermal yes. equipment above it. We leave it just like that. So we've seen two spacecraft here. Where are you hiding spacecraft three? Yeah, the other spacecraft <laughs> is in the other integration. So I would like to invite uh, you all to the integration number four. Super. So we'll try to make a small uh, route here. One is in the integration number four. Mm -hmm. And that spacecraft, okay. yeah. <laughs> that spacecraft is, uh, we are about to finalize all the, uh, the tests. So uh, we fun we, the last test we did on that spacecraft was the electromagnetic compatibility test. So it's inside a big anechoic chamber. This is where we are going right now. Super. Um, so we did get a question asking, how do we send satellites into orbit? Comment on amène les satellites dans l'espace? On utilise euh, des fusées. Alors dans ce cas-ci, pour nos trois satellites, ils vont être euh, lancés simultanément dans l'espace. Et on va utiliser des satellites, euh, je vous inviterai à avancer un petit peu pour euh, que la porte puisse se fermer. Merci. Alors, ça sera trois satellites qui vont être lancés euh, avec le, la fusée Falcon 9, Falcon 9 de SpaceX en, euh, de Vandenberg en Californie. So, Vandenberg in California and Montreal, Canada, it's a bit far. It's a long how way, are we, eh? How are we transporting those? Yeah, we need to uh, use some uh, transport container. So, we're going by ground. So, we're not flying the spacecraft there. We are using a van, a big truck, with uh, obviously escort cars to make sure that it's fully protected at all time. It's about a journey of 10 days. So it's going to take wow. uh, yeah, 10 days. And we have, as you know, the road conditions are not always good, right? I'm thinking about so, some of the potholes we see yeah, around town. So we need to be <laughs> careful that uh, we don't... Uh, actually, we have good damping system inside the shipping container. We also have shock uh, recorder to make sure that uh, we know what kind of shock levels the spacecraft has seen during, during its journey to California. So, but we are used to that now. So it's, uh, it's not a big deal for us. Right, not our first time. Uh, not the first time. So we are currently going into integration number four. So in this integration, we have uh, the anechoic chamber, as I've mentioned earlier. So so we are currently finalizing the blanket work on the spacecraft number one. So I would like to get closer. So I would like to uh, invite you to go inside the chamber since we have a lot of special guests today online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay. So can you tell us about the chamber? What is it used for? How, why are the spikes yes. so coming we are, out at us? We are <laughs> using these, uh, these RF absorbers. So all these spikes that you see here is to absorb the RF energy coming either from the spacecraft or from the outside environment. Actually, this chamber is very special because it's like a, it acts as a Faraday cage, meaning that once you close all the doors, if you are trapped inside 
forget about using your cell phone to call your mom <laughs> to help you out. It's, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So uh, thank you. So uh, we are using this kind of, uh, of phone here. So the RF energy, the radio frequencies, would hit those mm -hmm. and get absorbed. So if you were to use a lot of power on some antennas, this will get very hot, like mm -hmm. a microwave oven, actually. It's the same okay. principle. Okay, so this will get you very hot. You don't want to be inside. You don't want to be inside. <laughs> and you don't want to test a high, high power either because you, want, you don't want to burn the chamber. Right. So we need to be careful when we, we use these kind of, uh, when we do this kind of test here. So, uh, and also once we close all the door, so the, the, the principle here is to test if we have some antennas inside on the spacecraft that will contaminate other antennas right. or black boxes, electronic black bo boxes. Yeah. So we want to make sure that the spacecraft is sound before, as I said before, before we send it to space because we cannot fix it once it's in space. So no EMI, no electromagnetic interference. That's what we're trying that's to right. avoid. That's right. Yes. Uh, so um, Byron on Instagram was asking, what are all the factors that you have to account for when designing the outer part of the spacecraft? So I'm guessing he's trying to allude to micrometeorite strikes, maybe uh, other yes. electronic uh, equipment, other satellites. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, we are we're just cover, actually, we, we, we use a type of blanket that is called MMOD for micrometeorite uh, orbital debris. Okay. So those are thicker blanket um, made of beta cloth. So it's a very resistant uh, uh, blanket that has like three layers. Okay. The first one will get most of the impact of a micrometeorite. The second one will act as a dispense spreader, will try to spread that, uh, that particle. The, the, that particle. Okay. And the last one will prevent the remaining of the particle to go inside the spacecraft. And how large uh, of a micrometeorite can hit this uh, blanket uh, before? Well, we hope none of them uh, hit our spacecraft. Of course, but if it were to yeah. hit, how well, big I, of a? I, I guess they, they could survive uh, like a one centimeter diameter particle okay. and less. Okay. Above that, it's very. Uh, it becomes very hard to uh, to sustain this kind of impact. We can see. I don't know if we can see a little bit. Um, uh, we can see the MMOD where the uh, blue uh, lab coat, uh, the gentleman there is currently hiding it actually. <laughs> so, uh, JF, JF, can you come out a little bit the one you just installed to show the MMOD? So we can see the white MMOD there. So this is what will protect the spacecraft from the micro uh, meteorites and small, very small debris. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Merci beaucoup pour votre temps. Thank you. Merci tout le monde pour vos questions. On n'a pas eu la chance de répondre à toutes les questions maintenant sur Facebook Live, mais après, on va répondre à toutes les questions sur l'Internet. On vous invite de visiter notre site Web et nos médias sociaux pour en apprendre plus sur le satellite RCM et l'espace en général. Donc, thank you, thank you, Jean-Michel, for your prochaine. time. Thank you for all of your questions. All the questions that we were not able to answer, we will answer uh, on Facebook after this live presentation. Um, but you can also visit our website or any of our social media platforms to get more information about RCM and space in general. Thanks very much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.